Thanks so much. Thank, thanks, Neha, for your kind presentation. It's a really a pleasure for me to be uh, with all of you to, today. Thanks for everybody. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to this wonderful world of narrative-based medicine. Um, it's a powerful world, and I hope at the end of the talk you will be understanding the amazing power of this kind of approach. It's an approach that utilizes patients' narratives in clinical practice, research, and education as a way to promote healing. Actually, uh, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes. And narrative medicine is helping really us to have new eyes in being together with our patient, but not only in being together with ourselves. This is my uh, journey, uh, not to be, to be out of reference, but just to, under to let you understand why I came to narrative medicine. I am a, a pediatrician, I am a neonatologist, I've been working for more than 20 years in neonatal intensive care, both in Italy and here in the UAE. Uh, I am a pediatric neurologist, even if I'm not practicing as a pediatric neurologist in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. I, am, uh, I receive some certification abroad. In, uh, my technical skills are, are, are very well concentrated on, let's say, intensive care and uh, pediatric uh, neurology. But uh, there was a certain time of my life uh, that I realized, and it was, uh, I was quite young still, it was around uh, uh, 2000, actually 2000. I was a young neonatologist at that time. And uh, I realized, uh, especially in, uh, after two personal experience, one personal and one professional, uh, I realized that I was already perfect from a technical point of view. I was able to, uh, to face uh, any kind of uh, technical problem in neonatal intensive care. I was able to intubate small preterm babies, inserting catheters, whatever. Uh, but I was not ready to face emotion. I was not ready to face death, for instance, especially death of newborns and children. I was not able to face difficult communication of chronic disease. And sometimes I wanted, I wanted just to, to run away instead of talking maybe to, to a couple of parents with the, with the difficult, with the difficult uh, uh, child. And uh, I think a feeling that most of us, both physicians and nurses, have been experienced in our life. So I needed to find a way to face this. And I found a way actually in narratives in experience the power of narrative and experience the power of practicing art in uh, my profession. So that's why I got a master in medical humanities. I got then a master in applied narrative medicine, teaching how to practice practically in everyday practice. Then I got a master in self-science, being aware of the importance of self-awareness for every, every healthcare provider. Uh, I am currently uh, a facilitator for narrative medicine atelier in the hospital settings uh, and member of the steering committee of European Society of Narrative Medicine and, of course, of the Italian Society of Narrative Medicine. Um, why? Uh, what we will do today? Uh, we will, uh, we will uh, define together uh, what's professionalism and what's humanism. We will explain the dynamic tension between the two. We will uh, ident identify ways to enhance humanism in our practice. So we will be talking about medical humanities. We will learn about the strong power of narrative-based medicine. We will learn about practical use of narrative-based medicine all around the world. And uh, we will be able to advocate the use of narrative-based medicine in clinical practice, not only, but in research and medical education as well. Professionalism, what's professionalism? Dame Janet Smith, English barrister and former High Court judge, she's defining the professionalism as a basket of qualities that enables us to trust our advisor. But it is interesting to know that our patient's trust in doctor is no longer assumed, and we know about this. So now we know that professionalism is a set of values, behaviors, and relationships that underpin the trust of the public as in doctors. And this is a reach through a display 
of appropriate professional qualities, of course, expertise, technique, probity, integrity, and humanism. So humanism is uh, any system of mode of thought in which human interest, values, and dignity predominate. Of course, we know that the ability the, 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 pro, the ability to provide care based on the professional uh, ability, sorry, uh, the, the provide care based on professional ability, yes, of course, to maintain the perspective, it's, a, it's, it's our job, of course, but we need to always to remember that professional and patient are equal members of the same human family. And these, we will see, are not simply words. There is an amazing, amazing article by Jordan Cohen that I, uh, I um, invite you to, to read, uh, explaining us very nicely how to link professionalism to humanism. At the end of the day, humanism is the passion that animates professionalism. But how can we do? Which kind of technique we can adopt on this? Of course, medical humanities can be can be the answer. We will see in a while. Uh, every single consultation that we have with our patients, both in outpatients and inpatient settings, is uh, presenting with this kind of dualism, the scientific versus the humanistic part. And be careful because the scientific is both related to, of course, our technique and the problem of the patient, but even the humanistic side is related to our humanistic side and the patient humanistic side. So every single consultation brings inside science and poetry and na a narrative, reason and emotion. Brings data, of course, numbers, but brings quality, brings words, brings the story. Normative versus descriptive population versus the, the individual, the society versus the patients. So the technical versus the existential side, the objectivity versus the subjectivity side, and the disease versus the illness. We will see what's the difference between this. Medical humanities are the way we can bring together the dualism of every single time that we meet a patient, this kind of dualism that we need to face every, every single time, inside and outside the consultation. Medical humanities are uh, the integrated interdisciplinary approach through biomedical, philosophical, ethical, historical, artistic, literary, anthropological, sociological data. Of course, and these are all data that we need to put together to record and interpreting the human experience of illness, disability, medical intervention. I bring in all these experiences through scientific literature. You will see, I will be mentioning during my talk, so many articles, so many scientific reports. Please just drop me an email if you are interested and if you want some to read some more, but I will bring already uh, many scientific evidence of what I'm telling. Medical humanities, of course, encompasses literature, writing, poetry, of course, the narrative medicine we will be talking today is together, all visual performing arts, what we call VTS, visual thinking strategies, another very powerful field, graphic medicine, movies, theater, music, UK, Canada, they're, they're already already the doctors is able to prescribe as a therapy, a theater walk to his own patients or music, movies. Of course, history of medicine brings us so many interesting information on this and some of the, the social science. The World Health Organization has been already producing many reports on this and giving us the evidence and the role of the arts in improving health, in improving well-being. Let's come to the core of the talk. What's narrative medicine? This is the definition by Rita Sharon. Rita Sharon is a professor in Columbia University, New York, in the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics. She's a medical doctor, she's a family doctor, 
a family medicine doctor, and she's the one who created the terms of narrative medicine in uh, back in 2006. It's the practice of medicine, of recognizing, absorbing, interpreting, being moved of the stories of illness. Being moved means being not only being touched, but means being um, being um, obliging the doctor to use the stories to create a proper clinical therapeutic approach to the patient. And it is it's interesting, even funny, to read that uh, what uh, Sharon wrote, telling that uh, she coined the term narrative medicine to signify this work, being careful to choose a name that would not immediately drive away her clinician colleague to the world the humanities could, you know, because uh, unfortunately still with our old education, you know, uh, we, we think that humanities should be taken away from our practice. This is not the reality anymore. It's not the reality why. I think this is the most important slide of my talk today, because oh, every single healthcare provider should be aware that the patient is experienced what, what we uh, expect the patient to be experienced is the disease, right? The underlying pathology, the biological defined pathology. This is only the practitioner perspective. It's what we study on our textbook. It's what we have been educated to study and to treat. But what the patient experience is not only the disease, is the illness, is his personal subjective experience is the family experience, is the caregiver experience in case of any chronic disease, in case of a, a baby admitted to the neonatal intensive cares. What the patient brings to the doctors is not only the disease, but is the disease plus the illness. Then the two are connected and are lived in a, so a social uh, environment, in a cultural environment, in an anthropological environment, according to that culture, according to that society. So the sickness, you know, with the social and cultural conception of this condition, all the cultural beliefs and reaction that the society has to that individual. And this will be very, very clear later on when I will be talking about the narrative medicine and research. This is a very important concept to be, uh, to, to be kept in our mind, disease, illness, and sickness. So narrative medicine, it's a clinical and therapeutic approach combining the different points of view of those taking care, taking part of the care process. All, all the characters, patients, caregiver, family doctors, society, through narratives in various forms of expression, dialogue, metaphors, biographies, accounts, poems. In this way, we can explore otherwise inaccessible dimension of the disease of the person, an other inaccessible dimension that data and numbers alone will never bring to us. There is a, a very, very uh, important phenomenology of the illness, you know? So as I was mentioning, the disease, of course, is the dysfunction of the biological body, but the illness is always a disruption of the lived body or the disruption of that family in case of a, a child, in case of a disabled person. So always there is a first person account and the experience of illness redefines the relationships the patient has to his own world and that family has to his, uh, its own world. What's the meaning of the illness? Every single illness bring five loss according to the philosopher, Professor K. Toombs. Loss of wholeness, loss of certainty, loss of control, loss of freedom to act, loss of the familiar world. And we can imagine how important is this in intensive care, in neonatal intensive care, in chronic disease, in oncology, in mental disease, in different cases of illness, different combination of the five loss. 
I will briefly read this poem. This is a poem that, uh, in my opinion, explain beautifully what does it mean, the different, the different level of disease, illness, and sickness. This poem is, uh, has been written by Abigail Lean. She uh, was a medical student at that time and, uh, look, was published on JAMA. JAMA is, our, is uh, one of our referral, you know, most, most important uh, scientific publication, 2018. Preparation. First, we learn a heartbeat by taking it apart and naming it. We studied valves as if they were pipes, what makes them rust or clock. And then we marveled how intricate the machinery, how precise the clock work, as if we had built it ourselves. How do you explain what it means to miss someone? Loss is not a kitchen appliance. It does not come with an instruction manual for how to clip and to trim the tantalus of your soul that curve around another person's fingertips. We were naive. We imagined that we could learn the architecture of grief simply by examining blueprints. We did not realize then that you cannot describe how to weed a garden until you yourself had tried to uproot a dandelion felt the ground surge in response. Education versus clinical practice. Huh? You can feel it, right? How it sounds to you now? Anybody wants to give a comment till now? Because now we will go inside. Eh? This is the, the what's behind. Now we will go inside in the clinical practice. We will go inside in the research. Anybody wants to give a comment till now? Angelica, this is Neha. Uh, I would just like to comment that this is extremely interesting for me. And it's something that reflects the daily clinical practice. What you're talking is something that I think every clinician experiences, but I did exactly. not know that it has been categorized and verbalized and scientifically studied. And thank you. The best example that I feel of that is that you have the same diagnosis of the disease in two different people, but the whole cultural and the illness perception Fantastic. and the sickness aspect makes it a completely different consultation with Fantastic. one patient with the same disease. And so I, I really, I mean, identify with what you're saying and I'm intrigued really. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Thank you. This is very important. And actually you are bringing beautifully to this slide, you know, um, this is uh, Trisha, Trisha Grilnak. She is a, a family doctor who now is working with the whole health organization, bringing awareness all around the world about narrative medicine. And uh, in this beautiful, beautiful article on British Medical Journal, look, this article is 1999, eh? it's quite old. She was already talking about narrative-based medicine in an evidence-based world bringing up to our attention uh, that the fact that every time we experience a dissonance in uh, trying to apply research findings, evidence-based findings in our clinical encounter, well, this is the time that we abandon the narrative interpreted paradigms and try to get evidence alone. And this is so true. Every time that you experience a dissonance, every time that you are scared to talk to a patient, every time that you are telling, how can I tell these patients that the child will never walk, that the child has a, a terrible brain damage, or... Uh, Whatever this, of course, I'm talking about my experience, but I think every, every every single healthcare provider has his own experience. Of course, as soon as you start working, of course, every time that you experience that dissonance, you need to get into the narrative paradigm, and this will help you. Will help you. So, narrative bed medicine is not an alternative. Be careful, it's not an alternative. It's a complementary to evidence-based medicine. Of course, we need to refer to data, we need to refer to, to lab, but 
there is so many, so many, so many uh, things and so many uh, important data that we need to collect around. Narrative medicine is, uh, is encompassing, you see, all the patients and citizen, of course, experience, but what's more is helping us, us in our self-awareness. And we will see in a while, we will see in a while how this is important. And of course, I will show you now how we'll help hospital managers, journalists, civil organization and government as well, because is creating a better way of providing care. Let's go inside. Narrative medicine and clinical practice. A physician, we saw, uh, is, uh, is giving us the idea, idea of a disease state, no, right? Is a thinking about the disease. The patient encounters the disease, of course, but encounters, as we have been seeing, the illness. And then there is the family around. There is the caregivers that they have their own expectation. So patient's agenda, versus professional agenda every single time that we meet a patient. A patient is not happy just to face and just to accept the professional agenda. Professional agenda means a nurse's agenda as well. Eh? Every single nurse, when, when you are talking with a patient in the inpatient setting. So when I'm talking about a physician, uh, just forgive me, is a healthcare provider. So Tailor care, the importance of tailor care. How can we tailor the care? We can tailor the care uh, getting a narrative competence. The narrative competence is the ability to use, absorb, interpret, and respond to the stories of the patients. And the amazing news today that I want to give to you, the narrative competence can be learned, can be learned. Can be learned how? First of all, learning how to have a narrative posture, how to approach every single patient in our daily practice with an active listening. Active listening, we know, is the first act of care. Receiving the news, reflecting about this, reflecting, reflecting practice in medicine is becoming an amazing, amazing um, uh, field now to be, to be developed. Attention, technical competency, self-care and self-awareness. We cannot do without. If we just move out our self-care and self-awareness, we will fall invariably in burnout. Being, a, 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 being able to create conflict management and humility, the importance of humility. We don't have, um, sorry, because I have something that is appearing in my, it's, ah, so, okay, no, done, sorry. The, uh, we don't, uh, we are not the master of the truth of the patient. We will see in a while the importance of humility. Even this slide is very, very important. This is uh, Kalitskus in narrative-based medicine, potential practice and pitfalls. Uh, another very important article to be, to be read. What's narrative competence is knowledge, of course, and be careful, it technical knowledge. Not only narrative knowledge and reflection. Keyword, reflection. So is the sensitivity to the context of the illness experience and the patient center perspective. So establish a diagnosis in, in an individual context instead of merely in the context of a systematic description of the disease. And of course, exploring the narrative communication skills, creating connection, always self refraction There are some very interesting techniques that we can adopt before, during and after, after every single encounter with the patient uh, to develop our ability in self-reflection. Why? Because the narrative competence has amazing benefits. Has amazing benefits not only in terms of patient healthcare provider, what we call empathic engagement, has amazing benefit in terms of healthcare provider and self, self-awareness, Healthcare provider and colleague, professional integrity, team building, 
and of course, healthcare provider towards the society, towards the management, towards the society, the public trust. How important is this, especially nowadays? Of course, I cannot do without mentioning two notes about empathy, an over, an over, maybe uh, an over uh, used word, but as healthcare providers, we need to be aware that empathic doctors, again, empathic healthcare providers, have been shown to diagnose disease more accurately than doctors lacking empathy. Very interesting. This is Oxford University Press, Halpern, eh? from detached concern to empathy. Patients with empathic healthcare providers are more prone to feel trust, participate in shared decision, and showing greater adherence to medical recommendation. So empathy can therefore have a role in clinical outcome. Empathy has been found to increase providers' job satisfaction, whereas decreased empathy is associated with higher levels of burnout. These are scientific data. These are evidence-based data. <laughs> And uh, does emergency physician empathy reduce the thoughts of litigation? Of course, the subject our management is interested in, of course. Of course, the, the addition of brief empathetic statements to emergency doctor's discharge scenario is associated with a statistically significant reduction in thoughts regarding litigation against evidence-based. And of course, look, this is a randomized controlled trial. These are not words. Empathy reduce thoughts of litigation. Again, patient complaints is due, the vast majority of patient complaints are due to miscommunication, suboptimal relationship, lack of empathy. So how important is it to be providing a tailored care? And this is one of my favorite. It's a very, very old article already in 1984, but is amazing and still valid. Look, the majority, the vast majority of the conversation between healthcare providers and patients, oh, sorry, the majority of the conversation between healthcare providers and patients are interrupted by the healthcare providers in this study by the doctors, we need to tell, before 18 seconds. The doctor is not allowing to talk, is not allowing the patient to talk for more than 17 seconds. Wow. Shifting the focus from patient center gathering to the doctor center conversation. Because of course, it's more easy. We want to bring to our house, you know, what we want to give and what we want to tell. We want to finish quickly, but this is creating loss of patients' in information, and this has a great risk. The risk, of course, of losing the trust that the patient has for us, but the risk of, develop of developing what Dr. Raneha was tell telling before, of developing a clinical focus based on incomplete data. Two patients with the same disease have two different kinds of illnesses, and we cannot provide the same to plan of care. This is Annals of Internal Medicine, 1984. Adding value by talking more. Talking is required for engaging patients in their care choices. And when patients are eng actively engaged in decision-making, they have better outcomes and less expensive care. Ah, this also is very important, narrative humility. Nowadays, all the uh, uh, scientific community is uh, prone to talk not only about uh, empathy, empathy we are thinking it's not enough anymore, but we need to practice narrative humility. We need to practice the awareness that the patient's story belongs entirely to him or her. And like the physician of mine, oh, this is the Lancet, eh? this is the Lancet. Unless the physician of mine, Dagupta, Dagupta or Lancet is, a, is, a, is very important. She's a, she a, a, a pediatrician, you know, in New York. And she's telling, I went to 
uh, I went to a, a physician the other day, I was sick and he was telling me, you don't have to say anymore. I know exactly how your story ends. Wow. And a clinician cannot, of course, ever exactly know how illness story begins or ends because can, we cannot complain the comprehend of the totality. So it's time to leave the old paternalistic approach of the medicine being uh, humane, being uh, aware of practicing narrative humility with our patient. This was published on Lancet, 2008. These are some practical strategies for practicing narrative medicine. This is the really basic, basic. Of course, we have, uh, I, I cannot mention here, but we have technique, very strong technique that we are practicing in our uh, facilitator atelier, atelier of narrative medicine in many hospitals around the world. These are uh, in everyday life. How can we do for every single healthcare provider? Ask always open-ended questions. What would you like me to know about you? No, no, do, do, do not interrupt the patient. Yeah. Ask the patients about to write about their illnesses. Writing is always a very, very powerful tool. Allow patients to discuss their concern. Be aware always of your body language, how you move, how you look. And write about the challenging cases. This is a very, another very, very important and powerful practice. When you have a challenging cases, and I'm talking about especially uh, intensive care, especially oncology, especially mental disease, when you have a difficult patients, go home and write about. Go home and do a kind of self-reflective practice. How I can, I, I, I feel that patient, how I feel that family what they are expecting from me and what I expect from them. Examine your stereotypes. All of us, we have stereotypes, especially towards some culture, right? Culture that we don't know. And ask, what do you think is going on? Ask, how other people describe you? And always at the end of the consultation, is there anything else I should be aware of? Just some basic practice. And be humble. Your truth is always incomplete unless you listen to your patient's story. These are our, let's say, advanced technique. We can study the narratives. We can practice the narratives. We can reflect together with our colleagues on the narratives with different technique by Kleiman, by Bury, by Arthur Frank, and uh, by John Lohner that has been publishing really recently a beautiful book, beautiful book about reflective practice on, on medicine. I will show you later. Everything is fine till now. Anybody wants to add comment? How it signs to you, to your practice? I would be very happy to have your comment on the way. Okay, we go ahead. Uh, practical use of narrative medicine. Christian De Lorenzo. Look, Christian De Lorenzo is attaché littéraire hospitalier officiel. So there is this hospital in Créteil. Créteil is a, a suburb of Paris, of Parigi. And uh, they have uh, an attaché littéraire. They have a, a, a professional who is uh, taking care of the narratives of the uh, healthcare providers of the hospital and of the patients of the hospital providing atelier, providing a monthly meeting under the supervision of the, uh, of the guru of narrative medicine that is in Rita Sharon in, uh, in uh, New York. And this is an amazing experience, amazing experience that we really hope many hospitals around the world, around the world will be able to uh, imitate. Critel experience. Critel has a narrative hospital. So every staff member has two hours per month included in the, in the normal rota, in the normal working hours, to be used in a narrative medicine projects. So what they do? They practice monthly meetings, narrative medicine monthly meetings, of course, uh, on a volunteering base under Columbia University supervision. 
Currently, I've been talking a few days back with Christian De Lorenzo. Currently, they have 40 healthcare professionals on board coming from oncology, NICU, palliative care, family medicine, surgery, psychology, and psychiatric, even surgery, yeah, that is uh, typically <laughs> a, a, a field that uh, you would never think how uh, interested can be narrative in a surgery. And uh, in the narrative medicine atelier, they practice a close reading, a reflective writing, creative writing, and then sharing, sharing the, their stories, sharing their experience with patients. And what they're, see, what they're uh, seeing, they are building up narrative competency, you know, in, the, in every single healthcare professional. They're promoting individual well being. There are very nice sentences, very nice poems, very nice accounts from the healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, attesting how relaxing it is to share together with their colleague writing without having any kind of hierarchy, any kind of uh, we, being everybody on the same on, on the same phase, on the same plan, on the same, you know, with the humility. And uh, this is creating a strong team building, is preventing burnout, and is creating an amazing snowball effect, of course, for the competency, the narrative posture and the narrative competency. This is a, a very interesting experience. And uh, there are experiences all around the world, actually, ready to, to talk with you, with single, if, if anybody is interested to have uh, other, other a practical example. Please don't tell me, please don't tell me we cannot practice in our busy, in our busy daily practice. I know already that you are thinking this. It's not true. The narrative competency is an attitude. It's just an attitude. And if you practice narrative competency, you are saving time. You are saving time because you are uh, establish a relationship with the patient that is helping you and the patient to go immediately on the right way. And uh, there are also uh, some articles online, you know, how to, uh, that are teaching us and are helping us how to practice in a busy, how to practice narrative medicine in a busy day. Of course, we need to start from the, from the students. Why I came to narrative medicine? Because nobody teach me anything about in my education because uh, at that time, of course, in the university, uh, nobody is, uh, is uh, teaching us how to communicate. Nobody is uh, teaching us how to enter in our patient stories. Now, thanks God, things are changing all around the world. Iona Heats, uh, on British Medical Journal has published this amazing also article telling how medicine is important for medical uh, education, nurses study and medical study. Why? She's telling, of course, that evidence-based medicine tempts us to try to describe people in terms of data from biomedical science. These are not and will never be enough. Such evidence is essential, of course, but always insufficient for the care of the patients. It gives an, as an alphabet, but as clinician, we remain unsure of the language. This is a beautiful metaphor. The numbers of the patients is our letters, but we need to understand what language we can talk with that single patient. So most clinicians are not scientists they have a different strong responsibility to attempt to relieve distress and suffering and to this end, to enable sick people to benefit from biomedical science while protecting them from the, its harm. And uh, of course, empathy and narratives, let's say we can substitute narrative humility, empathy with narrative humility, be preserved in medical education, but this very interesting and very new 2020, 2020 see, in, on the International, International Journal of Medical Education. And uh, Astrid Serberger is uh, showing us that in the medical education, this is interesting for those of us uh, are working with, uh, with the young students, and we have young students in the hospital. And uh, 
Of course, there are some educational associated promoters of empathy, but there are also educational associated inhibitors of empathy. These are very interesting uh, uh, accounts from our students telling that multiplicity of patients, positive role models, reflection and self-awareness are of course promoters of empathy, but we have also educational associated inhibitors. Look, lack of professional competence. This is a students are telling, if I don't know, of course, the disease, if I don't know what I'm talking about, I cannot approach the illness of the patient. The importance, of course, of the base, the disease, I need to study the disease and then I can go ahead to, towards the illness. This is very interesting for those of us who are tutors of medical students. A high stress and empathy hostile medical culture is an inhibitor. The students is telling when I was a patient center or empathetic, specific tutors told me that I worked too slowly and was too faint hearted. These students is not becoming an empathic doctor or an empathic nurse, of course, if there is a tutor who is stopping her of being patient-centered. Private experience functions as promoters of inhibitors. We cannot do without of our private experience, come on. When we, when we face a patient that has, is a mirroring our own experience or our family experience, our parents' experience, of course, we need to make uh, keep in count that uh, this can be either an inhibitor or an, a, a, a supportive for our empathy. So very, very, we need to be very careful. Empathy can be taught, but can be taught by, uh, again, self-awareness in the tutors, self-awareness in the, in the teachers. Uh, thanks God, this is just an example. Many universities all around the world are introducing uh, medical humanities, not only the Columbia University in New York, Stanford University. They have, uh, they have uh, um, periodical meeting. This is in Italy. This is uh, the King's College in London. I mean, they have an amazing master in medical humanities. And what's more, Khalifa University is beautifully starting a course in on reflective practice in uh, medicine and so on. So many, you can just Google and medical master medical humanities and you will find all over the world. And this is so reassuring for the new generations of the healthcare providers. <clears throat> again, World Health Organization, again, Trisha Greenland, cultural context of health, the use of narrative research in the healthcare sector. The narrative medicine can be, and they go towards the end, can be used, can be practiced, and in, uh, in research, of course, using uh, uh, qualitative methods. Qualitative methods, we will see in a while, is just the other side of the coin of the quantitative methods. Evidence-based medicine, data, and qualitative methods, experience the same side, the two different side of the same coin, the patient and the patient experience, you know? These are all the qualitative methods. This is a beautiful review uh, by Vishnu Renjit. B Vishnu is a surgeon working both in Ireland and in Bahrain. And uh, uh, I was amazed seeing uh, how a surgeon is start writing about qualitative research. And these are the all the different way that we can use our research, narrative research, phenomenological research, grounded theory research, ethnographic research, different culture. We need to know historical research and case study uh, research. Uh, if you are interested, you can go ahead. And uh, this is exactly in the same article, Vishnu is reporting two sides of the same coin. You see, the qualitative research and the quantitative research, both with the same dignity, both with the same power. Uh, let me finish with uh, uh, some notes about the narrative maternity project that I practice in our hospital um, with the, uh, for the project master in, uh, for my master in applied narrative medicine. 
I've been uh, using uh, semi-structures interview. Uh, I collected 35 narratives from 12 Italian moms, uh, eight Emirati moms, and 15 from other countries, exploring their emotion and feelings during delivery and after delivery. And uh, please be aware that not always our patient, even if when everything is fine, even if when uh, the baby is a term baby, not admitted in the NICU, staying in the postnatal for just two days, not always for the mom, this is a pleasant experience. So be humble, be aware of this when you're approaching the mom. These are some of the narratives of our own mom. The first day after the childbirth was the worst. Instead of feeling happy, I was so traumatized. Sometimes I had the impression that the baby was taking too much from my body, the stretch marks, the weight increasing. I was alone from my family and this made me feel so alone, even more scared. And everything is centered on my baby. The mother goes on the background and wanted to have time for myself to be helped. Fear, sense of loneliness, need to rest. These are among the top emotion every single mom is experienced after delivery. And this we can understand only if we collect narratives. The mom will never tell you in the postnatal world in 40 hours, right? The other things that make me really think, in investigating breastfeeding, please be aware that the mom are feeling stigmatized if they are not able to deliver naturally or breastfeed. These are the narratives of the mom who, want, who didn't want to breastfeed or was not able to breastfeed after the, the, the delivery. Don't be pushing them if they don't want. I feel ashamed because I did not be able to deliver naturally. Before delivery, you read and to hear too much about breastfeeding, then you face a reality. They should tell you breastfeed is a hard job. They made me feel uncomfortable as I did not want to breastfeed, full stop. They should arrange supporting group for moms, not only breastfeeding supporting groups. This is very interesting, look. And these are data that we would never, never known unless collecting interview. So now we know, and I finish, why narrative medicine is not a way to cure, but a way to healing. A cure signify the banish of the physical illness. A healing is much more. Healing is not a physical cure, but repairing and strengthening the mind and the spirit to improve the quality of life of that patient, of that family. Look, even when no physical cure is possible, always keep in mind this. And we go back to Hippocrates when he was telling it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. Some basic lecture, Rita Sharon, for, for those of you who made, uh, who are interested or curious about narrative medicine, this is the book we cannot do without, Honoring the Stories of Illness from Rita Sharon, Bridging the Gap Between Evidence-Based Care and Medical Humanities, Maria Giulia Marini, and The Wondry Storyteller by Arthur Frank. And this, two by John Loner, two very practical book, how to practice narrative competence and the reflective practice in medicine in our daily practice. Two amazing, very practical book. I thank you. These are my reference. And of course, I would be very, very happy to receive any comments now and any comment on my email. And uh, if you want some more information, if you want to be guided how to go deep in narrative medicine, narrative competency, I'm more than happy to help you all. Thank you so much for your interest. And it was a honor for me to be today with you. This was really, very, very interesting. And, um, you know, uh, it's interesting to know that so much scientific work has been going on for so many years on this topic. And now we are, um, you know, we are applying it. So it's it's very, very interesting. Uh, there have been some comments from Asma Farid. Today's discussion introduced me to a new thought process in my daily practice. So Fantastic. that's one conversion you already Thank have. Thank you, Asma. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really 
uh, happy and uh, really humble by 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 this. Great, fantastic. Masahib Turi, interesting topic indeed. So this is the comments that we are getting. Um, and uh, let me see if there are any more questions from Emanuela. Thank you so much. We needed this information from Hannah. Um, very interesting topic. Thank you. So lots of um, lots of appreciation coming in there. Um, I just wanted to ask you that uh, you know, at, please. Uh, you've talked about uh, listening to the patient and being empathetic and having humility. Yeah. And at the same time, you've talked about self care and self awareness yeah. for the physician which yeah. I feel is very important because to be able to give, you have to have your cup full. Yeah. Uh, but um, sometimes uh, in my personal practice also, I felt, and when we go as a patient also, I felt that there's a slight, uh, you know, sort of not conflict really, but a difference of opinion or approach or, or cultural background, let's say, or, or even just the value system between the physician and the patient. And it's, Sometimes very difficult as a physician to, to know that medically something else is needed, but yeah. culturally or, or because, of, because of their attitude, they want to choose another pathway. Of course. And how do we support them? Like I've had a cancer patient who refused to take chemotherapy and went for natural therapy, yeah. which was very difficult for me to support, you know, yeah. knowing that I was not convinced that that yeah. would be the best thing for her. So what is your opinion? Of course, of course. Of course, the story uh, of the patients is, uh, is with the patient <laughs> and is with the family. And uh, this is uh, what you are bringing Neha to our attention is exactly the anthropological side and the ethnological side of the medical humanities. No, That's why we need to study. We need to study. We need to study. We need to enter the different culture. We need to enter the different uh, opinion, the different background of the patients. Right. Because, of course, uh, we are not aware. And uh, especially in this uh, it's very easy for me uh, when I was practicing in Italy, let's say 90% of the population was having the same culture. In this, uh, in this country is uh, so challenging because uh, we are beautifully meeting so different culture every day. So that's why exactly data are not enough. Laboratory is not enough. And uh, it's only, it's only a, a little part of that patient history, of that patient background, of, of that patient agenda. So uh, again, narrative posture, active listening to the patient, and, um, and self-reflection and reflection of the narrative of the patient, of the family of the patient, and uh, a narrative competence, of course. And uh, it's, a, it's a balance. It's a balance that you, that you learn with the, with the practice, but that should be uh, keeping into consideration uh, all the different sides of the coin that sometimes are not only two, but are <laughs> more than two. <laughs> Dr. Samina has her hand raised. Uh, maybe she wants to ask something. Dr. Samina. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Patrick, a, a wonderful presentation and such an eye opener, you know, um, with our current uh, workloads and the pressures and everything else. I think this is one field of or discipline of medicine which we've sort of pushed aside to the side because obviously it's time consuming and I think that's one of the challenges um, as well that it's the time I think what I think Dr. Neha and others not Dr. Neha also touched on that uh, getting the time to have that empath empathetic touch that that humanity I think unfortunately is being lost in in, in, in this world of um, moving forward and you know under pressures and all and uh, I, I think this is something we definitely need to sort of explore and try to uh, accommodate, even if it takes one minute. I think what we forget is that one minute means a lot to that patient. It may just be one minute, a kind word. It may just be touching on something, but that one minute changes the whole perception. Um, and, and I think that's, that's very important. And um, the second thing, which I sort of sometimes, I think you've touched very well, but something I find is a bit of a challenge is the difference between the medical humanity um, and ethics and the, and the challenges which are brought forward by these uh, things. So just those are my comments. Um, lastly, if you could share this presentation, Dr. Frederica, it would be a of reference course. point for all of us. Um, it's a wonderful uh, presentation and definitely uh, I think we all need to learn more from this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Samina, for your comment. 
Uh, I go back on the time, of course, this is uh, an observation that is uh, coming uh, every single time that you have a kind of uh, lecture of this kind uh, with, uh, with colleague. Um, what I can uh, tell you that actually it's becoming the narrative competence, it's becoming an attitude. Uh, if you practice in your daily practice, uh, you cannot do without. So it's just a different way of working. And uh, so actually at the end of the day, uh, you are saving time. You are saving time because the patient has a, a more trust and uh, you don't risk burnout or you have a less, a less fatigue because you are more satisfied about your result. So at the end of the day, you save time, you feel more satisfied. And it's not only my single experience, but is again already the qualitative research that is showing us this all around the world. I, I haven't had any more questions, Federica, but I just want to add like to this thing of saving time. I feel, I mean, I totally agree with you because, um, and the burnout, because one, the responsibility then of the outcome is shared. So the stress on the physician that exactly. we used to have, that we have to treat the patient, the patient should be fine, has now probably changed from the patient should feel fine, should feel better, rather than exactly. be better in terms of lab values, right? That's, that's one. And secondly, I feel these days, uh, and this is very important that this is being you know, uh, enhanced at this time because patients know everything. They have read Google, they have read the internet, they have read even RCTs, and then they come to us and say that this is what I have and this is what I need. You know, sometimes it's very difficult exactly. because they, they come with a list of medicines that they think they need and they just want you to prescribe it. But that's where this, this component comes in where if we can connect with them then maybe we can do more for them than Google can and, and you know, be their physicians rather than just their data provider. <laughs> of course. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Any more questions or comments? Uh, we, are, we are still waiting to discuss. We have a few minutes. If you want to discuss any case you had with, with Dr. Federica, take her experience on that or any com more comments, we still have a couple of minutes. Just really take a few minutes. Uh, uh, case, case. I have, I have. Uh, actually, if you want, I can tell you why. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice. Why, why I approach narratives. I approach narratives simply for a case that happened to me in the neonatal intensive care in 2000. 2000. I was a young neonatologist. Again, or already well formed from a technical point of view. What happened to me? Uh, a couple of parents they just refused their own. Uh, little preterms because unfortunately the preterms had a bad intracranial hemorrhage. So he was, uh, he was having a, a bad uh, uh, neurological damage and, um, and they, they just refused. Leaving the patient, leaving the little preterm to my care and uh, being detached physically and emotionally from that baby. And the baby, when the baby unfortunately passed away in a very hot uh, afternoon of, uh, of an Italian summer, I was alone with that baby. So at that time, I realized that my technical approach was not enough. I needed to, to, be, to be safe for myself. I needed to be ready to face this kind of reality as a neonatologist, because this can happen. It happened to me. And uh, luckily we had at that time an amazing psychologist in our group already who was supporting the, uh, the parents of our little babies and the, the professionals of the NICU. And she asked me to write. She told me, please Federica, uh, keep it down, keep it out, write black on white. And I start writing about this experience, taking it out. And this of course helped me. Help me, and then I, I realized the reason why that parents had refused that without any judgment. I put myself in a kind of self-awareness attitude, and I realized all, all I understood better what happened that time and why they refused their, 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 their patients, their, their little baby, and I realized their own reason, you know, without judgment and uh, without being in, uh, in uh, of course, uh, without going uh, in, uh, in uh, personal sufferance for this. And what's more, 
It was July at that time, Christmas time, December. The mother of this patient sent me a gift at home. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear from her for six months. And Christmas 2000, she sent me a gift at home with a card writing, thanks Federica for being with me, not only as a doctor, but as a woman. And this make the difference in my daily practice. And this was the story that made me change the way of working, or, or at least try to find a way uh, of working. What was the power of reflection? You know, power sure. of reflection, power of reflection. And oh, one I need day that. after another, yeah, without reflecting. And that's the power of reflection that you just mentioned. We, we don't need to be, please, I, I really, I invite you not to be scared of, of being reflective. If you have any difficulty with a patient, of course, this can happen, but sit, think, and write about this. Take it out. Or invite even your patient to write. Okay? And then the, to share if he wants or not to share if he doesn't want. And of course, in a, in a fantastic world, we should have a narrative medicine atelier uh, to discuss together different professional, different, uh, different story. This would be uh, an ideal world. <laughs> One question has come up uh, from Musahib Turi. Fantastic presentation indeed. How would the main components of family medicine approach of ideas, concerns, and expectations be related to narrative medicine? Would you of like course. to say something? Uh, yes, of of course, uh, of course, uh, we can. Uh, I, I'm not a family. I'm not a family doctor. I am. A, I am. A, 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 yes, pe pe a family pediatrician is a, is a kind of family doctors, of course. <laughs> of, of of course, I, I, and each of us is becoming a family doctor. Actually, family medicine. Thanks for your question because you make me reflect now that every single. Uh, practitioner uh, needs to become a family medicine doctor because uh, behind every single patient there is a family always no at any age this is this is interesting and uh, narrative medicine encompass all the competency all um, all the kind of uh, attitude of course the ideas and concern and expectation this is exactly what i've been proposing as a patient's agenda and uh, doctor's agenda, right? And uh, healthcare professional agenda. Um, be, always con be always aware that every single time that a patient is entering our, our office is coming with his own agenda, you know? It's not clean, it's not white, and it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not open to receive only our agenda. So is, is absolutely related, is narrative medicine. Uh, ICE, ideas concerned expectation of family medicine is narrative medicine. And uh, uh, it would be, of course, the, the, the challenge, the main challenge is to develop our narrative competence, you know, to, uh, to get the best from this and to practice at, at, at the best. You in your practice as well. Uh, a few more comments about how amazing the presentation was. So, Dr. Federica, we are very, very happy. And I think, I'm although happy. we don't want to go, and I would love to continue this discussion, that the clock is ticking and uh, we will wrap up now. So, thank you, everybody who has helped put together this, uh, this CME. And of course, a big thank you, Dr. Federica, for sharing her experience, her knowledge, and giving us such a wonderful insight and so much to think about this morning. Please send me send me your comment to my email. Send your uh, curiosity questions. Uh, more than happy to support. More than happy. I will talk to you. Maybe we can make this into a workshop at some point. Fantastic. And have it more interactive later. Fantastic. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so Thanks much. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you.